Hey everyone, I'm Pete and in this audio dynamics presentation I will provide some insight into my enclosure design process. Right away, this is not a tutorial, rather a deep dive into one of several design strategies that an engineer may rely on for this type of work. Just to keep it practical, I will go over a typical subwoofer enclosure design request, and this one is for a single Audio Dynamics 4200 Series 12 going into a 2018 Chevy Suburban. The available dimensions are 46 by 15 by 14 inches, and the client is looking for maximum output between 30 and 60 Hz, listening in the front driver's side headrest. So, first I'll want to define my listening space. And since I already know that the acoustic energy will be confined to the interior of the Suburban, may as well start there. All my cabin profiles are written in the OpenSCAD 3D modeling language, which is reasonably easy to parse and to generate from a spreadsheet. I can also write it from scratch or simply modify it as new, similarly shaped vehicles enter the market. For the most part, these are just crude approximations, dimensionally accurate only between the major surfaces, surface angles and various other acoustically non-transparent features. It's also worth noting that this isn't limited to vehicle interiors. Just about any shape that I can script in OpenSCAD can be exported, almost verbatim, and defined as the perimeter of a listening space including large home interiors, public address venues, and so forth. These perimeters can be assigned damping factors and models with different values can be stacked to represent, for instance, a vehicle with a rigid, acoustically dead floorboard, a mesh of body panels with some low frequency losses, and perhaps a highly compliant convertible roof. Next, there has to be an input coordinate, this is where I'm listening from, and since the client is interested in the response to the headrest, I'll just hover it there. This is generally something that I'll tag as I'm writing the model, but for the purpose of this video and apart from all the rendered graphics, I'm using OpenSCAD as a viewer for what would otherwise just look like me launching a series of macros. Next, I'll want to define some outputs. This is what I'm listening to. And a separate output is configured for each path that the pressure takes in or out of the enclosure. This includes the individual vents and the individual drivers, each defined by a set of coordinates, the inflow outflow orientation along those coordinates, and the radiating area. So, for instance, an enclosure with three subs and three vents would need a total of six outputs to represent all the radiating elements, their respective positions, and which way they're facing. Anyhow, if I'm not already familiar with the driver's behavior, I will model it in the lowest plausible acoustic order. So, just to walk the 40 to 12 through that process, going strictly by the TS parameters, I can see that an efficiency bandwidth product of 67 and a total Q of 0.433 indicates optimal performance somewhere between sealed and vented, at least by the conventional wisdom. So, for the benefit of the exercise, I will model it both ways, starting with sealed, which also means that I only need one output. My enclosure templates are built in FreeCAD, and these are fully parametric models with live feedback to the spreadsheet workbench where the dimensions are formatted into a node-based script for the entire signal path, including all the metadata for how everything is shaped. I can also express these as a one-dimensional chain of lumped elements for analysis in something like the acoustic abacus, if anyone remembers that. Anyway, here's a sealed model, some dimensional constraints from the request form, Output 1 inside the Suburban connects to the enclosure through the piston area of the sub, and now that everything has dimensions, I can offset the model so that it sits right where the actual enclosure will sit. Once the simulation is ran, a 96-point proactive data table is dumped into a spreadsheet. This is where all the response and the impedance information is plotted and compared. I can also import this in the room EQ wizard with a series of smoothing filters or generate vertices for the presentation graphs. Anyhow, this is my first glance at how the sub operates with the pressure emanating from the back of a sealed cuboid in the cargo area, traveling across the Suburban, and consolidating up front where the listener sits. I can also change the listening coordinate to see what's happening at the dash or anywhere else inside the cabin model. So, for instance, if I'm designing an SPL enclosure for someone being metered at the passenger side footwell, that is a completely different transform function from the one describing what happens at the driver's side headrest. And what I'm seeing at the headrest is that the sub, even with a full 119.82 liters of chamber volume behind it, is almost unusable for what the client is asking. Just for reference, an equal loudness counter for the upper threshold of the decibel scale will look something like this. Here it is gated between 30 and 60 Hz, and this is roughly what we're shooting for, ideally with a 1 watt sensitivity somewhere at or above the 90 decibel threshold. It's also worth noting that as the sealed chamber is incrementally reduced in size, with each new trace representing a quarter volume reduction, it becomes apparent that the acoustic suspension alone has very little influence over the total Q factor. 
There also doesn't appear to be much of a difference as I move the driver across the back and then across the top of the enclosure. So if these are my variables, at least now I have an insight into why a sealed enclosure of any size or orientation isn't going to work. And I've gone through the process of checking because, as you just saw, the TS parameters are just indirect hints when they aren't plugged into anything. And regardless of what the QTS or the efficiency bandwidth product suggests, the 4212 is a heavily backwave dependent driver. So, next I'll want to explore some vented solutions. And for that, I'll need a second output map to wherever the backwave exits the enclosure. Here's my template for a simple transmission line representing the lowest acoustic odor among the vented enclosures. And once everything is linked up, it becomes immediately apparent just how backwave dependent the 4212 actually is. The main problem that I'm seeing now is the steep efficiency bandwidth imbalance. This is largely to do with how the driver manages its motor force and there is only so much that can be done to correct this given the circumstances. Right away, the response tells me that the system is severely under dampened and with the enclosure template already populated with the maximum available dimensions, a larger, longer waveguide simply isn't an option. That just leaves me with a series of variables that control the extension and the sensitivity, more so than the shape of the response. And these include the overall line length, constrained by the maximum width, the average cross section, constrained by the maximum height and depth, the line taper, constrained by the driver's mounting clearance, and the driver's position along the waveguide, constrained by a combination of everything I just listed. In other words, there appears to be no practical form that a transmission line can take in this particular space with this particular sub to let me dial in the response that I'm after. Though this is only the third order with plenty more ways to control the driver. The main takeaway here is that sometimes it's not the enclosure type that's the problem, obviously transmission lines can sound amazing under the right conditions. Oftentimes it's the geometric limitations of the available space, clearances and the driver's electromechanical incompatibility with these circumstances. Case in point, if I simply pull the 4212 out of that model and swap in a 2212, already the response at the listening position is far less problematic. But that's also not an option, so instead I'll have a look at what the 4212 does in a fourth auto enclosure. Here's my template for a single stage bass reflex once again populated with the maximum available externals. This one is set up for modeling with quasi-cylindrical waveguides and I have presets for all the common cross sections used by Precision Port and similar vendors. Though, after some modeling it becomes apparent that none of the four common vent models at any length or quantity will give me a consistent 30 to 60 output. Again, this has to do with how the 4212 manages its motor force, but there's also a series of physical constraints like the maximum achievable vent length, the axis on which these vents don't run into other solids, and the mounting area per vent relative to its throughput. Case in point, with an outer flare diameter of 9.25 inches, I can only side fire a single 6 inch vent with 3 4 inch vents as the next closest option. So, that's an entire side of the enclosure in exchange for about 37 square inches of laminar throughput, and that's if there's clearance between the ports and whatever panel extends past the wheel well. A quick image search tells me that it's all flush, so I doubt it. And the resulting frequency trace indicates even worse damping than with a transmission line. Thankfully, I can restore some of the pneumatic properties by reducing the chamber volume, in this case just dragging the left wall over, and to maintain the response I also have to reduce the vent area given that the precision ports are already at their full length. In the end, however, the 4212 does not appear to benefit from capacitive damping other than to have all the acoustic energy lump around the system resonance. This is the all too common one note wonder scenario, and a lot of prefabs suffer from this simply as they do not distinguish between how different drivers need to be controlled. What's more, by the time I've exercised the constraints down to 31 liters of damping volume with a single 3 inch precision port maintaining the response, the velocity through the cylindrical passage at power reaches well over 100 meters per second which is completely unusable especially given the mediocre sensitivity. Even at an intermediate volume this would lend itself to chaffing dominated by hollow sounding piston flutter. Another way to impose damping is to make more thorough use of the inductive properties, in a sense mass loading the piston. Here is one of my folded waveguide templates, and I can use this to sweep across a whole range of fourth auto alignments including reloaded horns, bass reflex and other less common variants. So once I've exercised the constraints for this scenario, along with a few other single stage templates, the most consistent response between 30 and 60 Hz is achieved with this rear loaded arrangement. And the sheer amount of inductive damping put in place to make this work 
relative to the available space tells me that a multi-stage base reflex will be of far more use, especially given that I don't actually need the enclosure to perform above 60Hz and some of that efficiency could be consolidated down into the sub-base. Here's one of my dual stage base reflex templates and I'll generally pick the starting layout according to how I expect the driver to react based on its behavior in everything I've modeled thus far. So if I already know that in a single stage scenario any significant degree of capacitive damping causes all the subs output to lump around the system resonance, in a dual stage scenario I can just pick whatever geometry results in the smallest possible chamber volume for the active side, which in turn limits the reactants that would otherwise result in the dreaded one note response profile. And with a second reflex stage driving down the upper slope, the output is consolidated between the two peaks. Also, as I shape the response you'll notice that I'm not tuning to a frequency as is often misunderstood. My focus is entirely on the curvature of the response trace because that is what you experience. Meanwhile, the only metric addressed by the tuning frequency is the inverse relationship between the vent velocity and the driver excursion. Case in point, once I've exercised the constraints for this scenario, the most consistent, indeed the most efficient response between 30 and 60 Hz is achieved in this arrangement. And if I solve for a tuning frequency, the active stage comes out to 63.87 Hz before air load impedance which, as you can see, doesn't really describe anything at the listening position. Further onward, the tuning frequency for the passive stage comes out to 39.7 Hz. Again, largely meaningless at the headrest. And I point this out because oftentimes a client will insist on a certain tuning frequency rather than a certain performance outcome, which invariably confines the flexibility of an acoustic model to a value that doesn't directly represent any characteristic of the listening experience. Just as a brief side tangent to illustrate this, I'll clear the cabin and load in this ordinary vented enclosure. 1.5 cubic feet of undisplaced chamber volume and a 34.75 inch long vent with a 21.875 square inch cross section. Mathematically, this puts the system resonance at 31.89 Hz, meanwhile here are three completely different performance outcomes simply as I swap three different 12s in and out of that box. And this is the inherent problem with defining or even referring to an enclosure by its tuning frequency. Rather than a specific outcome, it describes an incidental property common to a series of outcomes which vary in tandem with the TS parameters. So let's focus on the tuning frequencies and instead eyes on the output. Speaking of which, as we return to the exercise, given that a single passive reflex stage is already enough to put the response on target, I'm not going to model any additional reflex stages. In all likelihood what I'm looking at here is already the most efficient use of the available space. I will, however, forego that intuition and fast track the sub through a series of bandpass iterations. Right away, here is a third order arrangement with all the constraints already exercised for the closest parity with the target response. I'm also back down to a single rectangular output as 100% of the pressure channeled into the cabin is through that vent. And while this is a notable improvement of our sealed enclosure, it is also not the way to control the sub, at least in the context of the desired outcome. Next up is this fourth order arrangement, once again already worked out to the optimum, and you'll notice that to achieve clearance the sub has to mount at an angle of 15 degrees on the y axis. Performance wise this is basically just a higher QTC variation of the third order bandpass and as such it is even less usable. In fact, this could be viewed as another example of how a client might inadvertently lock himself into a poorly performing design. Supposing for the moment that the request specified a fourth order bandpass as the one and only way for me to exert pneumatic influence of the driver, suddenly this is the best we can do. And the takeaway here is that you should always let the driver's behavior dictate what type of an enclosure to counterbalance it with instead of uncritically confining your options to something that may not even work. Up next, here is the optimal 5th order series tuned bandpass, already a far better candidate performance wise. In fact, so is the optimal 5th order parallel tuned variant. And just like their third order counterpart, both designs take advantage of the minimal forward clearance as the sub fires directly into a waveguide. The only limitation here is that the vents have to fire upward, at least in the real world. In software I can still flip the model to examine the difference in response even if it violates the maximum height constraint. Going up to 6th order means that the driver returns to its 15 degree tilt with the chamber on either side of the piston. And since there simply isn't room for a duct between the two, that just leaves me with a parallel tune variant. Here it is with the constraints exercised for the target response and this is also where it becomes apparent that I'm running out of maneuverability. Despite all the individually controllable forces acting on the driver, 
my best attempt to match the equal loudness contour is already further off target than at least one of the fifth order models. Meanwhile, there's really no room for any additional reflex stages, which also marks the upper acoustic threshold for this exercise. Next, the optimal enclosure style is determined in part by the reference efficiency and in part by the aerodynamic losses along the pressure path, so the tallest trace doesn't necessarily indicate the most efficient throughput, which is what ultimately governs the enclosure's performance at volume. Bearing that in mind, it looks like there's a toss-up between a dual-stage bass reflex and a fifth-order parallel tune band pass with the average efficiency favoring the latter. However, it also looks like the pressure flowing through the lower frequency vent in the bandpass enclosure has about the same overall velocity as the outer stage vent in the dual reflex enclosure. Difference being that in the case of the bandpass, this also represents nearly 100% of the output along that bottom hump, and only a smaller portion in the case of the bass reflex with the piston reinforcing the output above and below the active chamber's resonance. So this is the more functional approach. Though it's also worth noting that closed candidates like these can sometimes flip depending on the manufacturing workflow. For instance, these templates are meant for basic wood construction. As such, they break the design up into a series of flat, set thickness panels with angles upwards of 45 degrees. Behind the scenes, each vent is defined as a chain of segments, each with its own starting and ending cross-sectional geometry, length, and a set amount of air load reactants applied at specific intervals to simulate the effects of each bend along the path. But if the same two enclosures were drafted for stack, fabrication or injection molding with uninterrupted cross sections and only the frictional losses of the airflow changing directions applied to the model, suddenly the fifth order bandpass emerges at a slight aerodynamic advantage. And just as a further aside, this is also one of the main reasons why I do not offer on-the-spot enclosure recommendations. There is literally no process that I can work through in my head that makes any of what I've shown you in any way redundant. Anyhow, once the dual stage bass reflex has been established as the best suited given all the conditions at play, I can move on to the structural considerations. For any given workflow, this comes down to some fine element analysis of the shearing forces along the driver's mounting cutout and the bending forces along the individual panels. Mind you, this is wood with anisotropic properties making the analysis helpful rather than exact at least with larger builds. Meanwhile, the point is to brace or to double stack only when doing so is of more benefit than the simultaneous cost of the resulting displacement and disruptions to the laminar airflow. That being said, there is no such condition here owing largely to all the internally adjoining baffles which also means that the final design can now be redrawn as an easy to follow set of step by step assembly instructions for the client. And this too will differ from one manufacturing process to the next, so if the geometry should happen to be more involved, the final assembly could take the form of a step file. Anyhow, as I'm often asked if a design that I've done will scale dimensionally, let me close with a couple of practical reasons as to why it will not. Right away, for an acoustic alignment to remain unaffected as you scale, the speed of sound would have to scale along with the physical measurements, which it obviously does not. Temperature notwithstanding, this is a constant. There is also an inverse correlation between the size of a driver and its efficiency bandwidth product. So, while the 4200 series 12 sits at a 67, a 10-inch version of the same driver brings that figure up into the mid-70s, and the 15-inch version drops it down into the mid-50s, in each case changing what it takes to put the response on target, inadvertently redefining the optimal layout or even the acoustic order. In fact, all these principles remain at play even as I swap to a different 12-inch driver, never mind scaling. Here, for instance, is what happens when I load a 1400 series 12 into the final enclosure for the 4200 series 12. And just for fun, let's also pull the enclosure out of the Suburban and stick it into a 91 Honda CRX. So, anytime an engineer consults you about the importance of driver and cabin specificity, something like this is probably what they're looking at behind the scenes. And it is also why you will never be advised to put the wrong speaker into the wrong enclosure or the wrong enclosure into the wrong listening space. As you can see, the degree to which these things matter can literally outweigh factors like how many drivers worth of piston area there is, or how much power there is going to them. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Don't forget to check the video's description for links to audio dynamic services and all the open source software used for this particular workflow. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!